community. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your reflections. That was very beautiful. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not bilingual, but my lovely colleague, Christina, will be here helping uh, summarize some of my material as I talk. Um, and so, so far, we've already seen some very beautiful images of Mary, yes, in our consecration, and also as an example in the home, as an instructor. Um, but I would also like to offer you some new kinds of images. Um, a character from the Old Testament named Hannah, Mary's mother, and a hymn we often call the Magnificat. So firstly, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about a woman named Hannah. We find her in the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, and she plays an important role as Samuel's mother. So if you're not familiar with her story, here's just a quick, like, Sparks Note version of it. So Hannah is the wife of a man named Elkanah, and he has another wife who has many children, but unfortunately, Hannah is barren and is unable to conceive. So Hannah prays constantly to the Lord for children, and one day in her misery travels to Shiloh to the capital city to pray to God in the temple. Eli, the priest there, sees her weeping and murmuring and thinks that she is drunk, but she explains to him that she's simply praying to the Lord. And in seeing her faithfulness, Eli tells her that she will receive from God whatever it is that she has requested. So upon her arrival back home, Hannah prays again, and telling, her, telling the Lord that if she has a son, she will dedicate him to the Lord and allow Eli to raise him as a priest. So her prayers are answered, and she becomes pregnant and has Samuel. After she has weaned him, she takes him back to the temple, and upon presenting him to Eli, prays a song of exaltation. Now later you'll hear more about this song and why it's important, but I'd like to recite a, cute, a few key parts for you quickly and ask you to keep them tucked in the back of your mind. You'll also see that song in your pamphlet there. And Hannah prayed, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted by my God. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in your victory. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. The Lord puts to death and gives life, casts down to Sheol and brings up again. The Lord makes poor and makes rich, humbles and also exalts. He raises the needy from the dust. From the ash heap, lifts up the poor to seat them with nobles and make a glorious throne their heritage. He guards the footsteps of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall perish in the darkness. For not by strength does one prevail. The Lord's foes shall be shattered, the Most High in heaven thunders. The Lord judges the ends of the earth. May he give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So now, for several reasons that you may have already noticed, Mary and Hannah have many things in common. Many theologians see Hannah as a model for Mary, and there are many ways that we understand the Old Testament as a prefiguration, a preparation, and a promise which is fulfilled in the New Testament. So to look at Hannah as a model of Mary means that we're looking at her in the Old Testament as a foreshadowing of who Mary is to become in the New Testament. So let's look at a few examples. Firstly, Hannah, like Mary later, bears a son by miraculous means. She's a devout woman who turns to prayer when she is distressed. And in her interaction with the priest Eli, she's also, this is an also similar meeting of Mary with the angel Gabriel, which we heard about this morning. So Eli tells Hannah after her prayer in the temple, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant what you have requested. Hannah's response to Eli is, Let your servant find favor in your eyes, which is very similar to Mary's, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And now, although Hannah is speaking to the prophet Eli here, and Mary's response is oriented towards the angel Gabriel, they both see themselves as servants of God and humbly understand their roles as being a part of of a larger mission of salvation. Thus, their roles in scripture are also centered around their motherhood because of their desire and acceptance to be mothers is critical in salvation. Through Hannah's cries for help and Mary's fiat, they were both collaborators of God's divine will, actively partaking in salvation history. More specifically, they are both mothers to future prophets. Hannah is the mother of the prophet Samuel, and Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is anointed as priest, prophet, and king. 
So now trying to see Samuel as a model of Jesus only goes so far, but you can see how Samuel's role in the Old Testament does foreshadow Jesus' role in the New Testament. Samuel does become a priest and eventually grows up to anoint King David, who is the beginning of the Messianic promise. And Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of that promise. Thus, we can see how Samuel's role emphasizes the importance of Hannah, just like Jesus' role emphasizes the importance of Mary. Lastly, as you heard from Hannah earlier, they both proclaim a song of exaltation. We'll look into Mary's song in a moment. And before I move on to talking about Anna, um, I'd like to invite Christina, if she would be willing to summarize a little bit for me. Un resumen muy breve de esta exposición. Encontramos la historia de Ana en el libro de Samuel 1, capítulo 2, en la que Ana sabemos que es una mujer estéril, que ella ora, pide a Dios el poder ser fecunda, el don de la maternidad, y se lo concede. Entonces vemos su canto de alabanza en el primer libro de Samuel, lo, lo encuentran en su libro en la página 8, voy a leer los primeros dos versículos. Entonces, Ana oró diciendo, Mi corazón se regocija en el Señor. Tengo la frente erguida gracias a mi Dios. Mi boca se ríe de mis enemigos porque tu salvación me ha llenado de alegría. No hay santo como el Señor porque no hay nadie fuera de ti y no hay roca como nuestro Dios. Así que el mirar a Ana en este, en este texto del, del Antiguo Testamento la podemos ver como un modelo de María, María, Madre de Jesús. Es una prefiguración de María. Y esta prefiguración se encuentra en algunos de los eh, paralelismos ¿no? que encontramos, por ejemplo, como las dos son mujeres de oración. Las dos acuden a Dios. Eh, las dos se ven como siervas del Señor, se puede ver en el cántico de María en el Magnificat y se puede ver en el cántico de Ana que acabamos de escuchar ahora. Las dos colaboran también en la historia de la salvación, eh, Ana como madre de Samuel, profeta, y María eh, como madre de Jesús, profeta y salvador. Y por último, eh, la similitud también de este canto de alabanza, de gratitud, que ambas hacen a Dios. So now that we've met Hannah, I'd like to speak to you briefly about someone else with practically the same name, Anna. You may also know her as Saint Anne, uh, who is the patroness of one of our parishes here in San Antonio. And although she isn't explicitly in scripture, we find her in tradition, in a book called the Proto-Evangelium of James, which you'll hear a bit more about later today. So in this proto-gospel, we can see how Anna has many similarities to the Hannah and Samuel that we just met. The proto-evangelium of, of James holds that Anna was also barren, crying out to the Lord in her distress. Her prayers are answered, and when Mary is born, Anna says, my soul exalts this day. And later, when she presents Mary to dedicate her to the Lord, she also proclaims, I will sing a holy song to the Lord my God. Thus, we can see how Anna's story in the Proto-Evangelium mirrors Hannah's story in Samuel quite closely. Also like Hannah in 1 Samuel, Anna's role in the story of this apocryphal gospel is mainly concerned with her motherhood. Along with a lot of other material, the story focuses on the way that Mary is born and Mary's childhood, so we don't get much information about Anna herself, but rather about her role as Mary's mother just like Hannah in the Old Testament as Samuel's mother, and Mary herself in the Gospel as Jesus' mother. Although it is unsure if the author of this apocryphal Gospel purposely chose to write Anna's story so similar to Hannah's in 1 Samuel, or maybe their lives did really just follow such a similar pattern, but it is clear that when we juxtapose Hannah of 1 Samuel and Anna, the mother of Mary, 
We can look at how Mary, as Anna's daughter, follows in the footsteps of this Old Testament Hannah in more ways than one. Because Anna is a model of Hannah, we can certainly say that Mary is then also a model of Hannah in 1 Samuel. En este segundo momento de nuestra reflexión, vemos a Ana, que es la madre de María. Y sabemos sobre esta historia porque se encuentra información en, el, en un evangelio apócrifo. Y en este evangelio apócrifo, el contenido que se adquiere de ahí es más sobre el papel de Ana, que es madre de María. Y se sabe que eh, Ana, Madre de María, era también estéril. Entonces aquí hay una similitud con Ana que acabamos de leer justo en el punto anterior, en, el, en la historia que encontramos en Samuel, capítulo 1. Entonces Ana, Madre de María, es también prefiguración ¿sí? de Hannah que acabamos de leer y es la Madre de María. And lastly, let's look at the last Im image that I have prepared for you. Um, this is a scene of the visitation. We get this scene from the Gospel of Luke, when after Mary hears from the angel Gabriel and conceives by the Holy Spirit, she visits her cousin Elizabeth. This is also where we hear an important and probably familiar line. When upon seeing Mary, Elizabeth says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Now, if you're reading through the Gospel of Luke straight through, Mary's response to her cousin's greeting may seem a bit strange. It's a long monologue that looks like a poem, which includes a lot more than just a simple thank you from Mary. In fact, it was probably some type of song, usually called a canticle, that was possibly sung by Mary as an exclamation of praise. Now, before I read it through for you, I'd like you to also think back on Hannah's song that we heard earlier. If you remember, some of the key themes were that Hannah exalts in the Lord and proclaims the ways that God humbles the rich and also raises up the needy. So with that in mind, here's the Magnificat. You can also find it in your program. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon his handmaid's lowliness. Behold, from now on all ages call me blessed. The Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age to those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm, dispersed the arrogant of mind and heart. He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped Israel his servant, remembering his mercy, according to his promise to our fathers to Abraham and to his descendants forever. It sounds similar to Hannah's song, yes? Let me point out a couple of places in particular for you. In Hannah's song, we hear her say, my heart exalts in the Lord, and Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. This word magnifies that Mary uses is almost synonymous with my heart exalts, and is actually where we get the title Magnificat. Magnificat simply means my soul magnifies in Latin. Also where Hannah sings, the Lord puts to death and gives life, casts down to Sheol and brings up again, she may be speaking to the Messianic promise, the way that the Messiah, who we recognize as Jesus, was put to death and brought up again. And we hear echoes of this in Mary's song when she says, God has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy according to his promise to our fathers. Now this promise is that of the Messiah, her son Jesus. And now the language between the two songs isn't exact, but they point towards the same thing and keep in mind the same concepts. Likely because Mary herself, as well as Elizabeth and Luke and Luke's audience were all probably familiar with Hannah's song. Being devout Jews, they most likely knew Hannah's song as part of their scriptures by heart and would thus understand what Mary was speaking about, even if she was proclaiming God's fulfillments in a new way. Luke, as the author of this gospel, also chose to record the song as similar to Hannah's for a particular purpose. 
The Magnificat is actually the first time in Luke's Gospel that the theme of salvation is introduced. And although Mary never explicitly mentions the word Messiah in her song, when Luke shifts from the narrative forms of the Annunciation and the Visitation to this canticle formulated in Israel's prayer language, there is an emphasis on the fulfillment of this promise of salvation. His shift from storytelling to this song of prayer allows his Jewish audience to think back on Hannah's hymn and come to understand that Mary is also talking about the Messiah, proclaiming that the promise they've been waiting for has at last been fulfilled. Thus, the fulfillment of centuries upon centuries of God's promise of salvation is certainly worth a celebration. In response to her cousin Elizabeth, Mary does not simply smile or say a few words, but her soul completely magnifies the Lord in joy, which is one of the many reasons why so many of the religious faithful today pray this canticle every day during Vespers, evening prayer of the Liturgy of the Hours. So like Hannah, Anna, and Mary, may we also sing hymns of praise for the many ways in which God has fulfilled his promise of salvation in our own lives. Thank you. Y un breve resumen del tercer punto. Vemos a um, María que va a visitar a su prima Isabel y en este canto del Magnificat María está hablando del Mesías. Proclama que la promesa que había esperado, que se había esperado en Israel, pues finalmente va a llegar a su, a su cumplimiento y a su plenitud. Entonces hay un paralelismo también entre las palabras de María en el Magnificat y el canto que escuchamos en el primer punto con eh, Hannah. Eh, Mi alma canta la grandeza del Señor, ¿no? dice María. Y Hannah dice, mi corazón se regocija en el Señor. Ambas también hablan en su cántico sobre el cumplimiento de la promesa que hizo Dios sobre el Salvador. No se trata de un lenguaje idéntico en estos dos eh, cánticos, pero sí bastante similar, en los que podemos ver que hay una similitud entre ambas. En el Magnificat, por primera vez, aquí en el Evangelio de Lucas, se habla sobre la salvación y se pone énfasis sobre el tema de la promesa de salvación que viene en su cumplimiento. El Magnífica sabemos que es una oración bastante conocida, se reza en las vísperas, en la liturgia, ¿no? en muchas tradiciones, en iglesias, en familias. Y así como Hanna, Ana y María han cantado la grandeza del Señor, nosotros también podemos cantar las grandezas que el Señor hace. Muchas gracias. Thank you. So just as we did earlier this morning, we'll also uh, break into your groups for some reflection. I also have some reflection questions for you prepared um, in the program. And I would also like you to take a look at the Hannah's song in the Magnificat and maybe see some other similarities that I didn't point out if you'd like to do that. Um, but a few questions for reflection. After learning about Hannah and Anna, what new things stand out to you about Mary? Hannah and Mary, through their yes to motherhood, both actively participate in salvation history. What types of fiats have you made in your own life that you have seen become a part of God's divine plan? And lastly, has there been a moment in your life where it was clear that God was fulfilling his promises to you? In what ways can we praise and exalt him like Hannah and Mary did in our own lives? So those are our questions for you. And I also have one more favor to ask of you. Um, this afternoon, we'll be having a Liturgy of the Word service. And I was hoping that um, maybe each group could present a intention for that service. Um, so if you would be willing or if you would like to, just think of um, a regular prayer intention that we would do at, uh, similar to what we would do at Mass. So um, where we would say, uh, we pray to the Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Um, so if you could formulate something from your reflections or um, anything that you would like, I'll be going around a, a lunchtime after lunchtime, um, just chatting with each of you if you would like to do that. Thank you. Las preguntas de reflexión se encuentran en la página 12, en español, por si las quieren leer. 
Y también lo último que comentó Alison es que les vamos a pedir eh, si por favor en cada grupo podrían pensar en alguna petición que les gustaría presentar en la paraliturgia que vamos a tener hoy por la tarde al final de nuestra sesión. Eh, va a haber un momento en que los grupos, cada uno de los grupos, va a poder presentar una petición ¿no? a nivel de agradecimiento, una petición de alabanza. Entonces, a lo largo también de la jornada podemos ir pensando en eso. Eh, les agradecemos mucho. Gracias.